Hello, I'm Liam and welcome to my video on how to choose the best compost for growing fruits, vegetables and herbs. Choosing compost in shops can be confusing and I hope this compost buying guide will help explain the best compost to buy by introducing what different plants need to grow and therefore which type of compost will be best for them. In this video, I'll talk about what compost is and why it is not the same as the soil or earth we have in our gardens. I'll introduce what a healthy soil is, as compost is only part of the story in providing the ideal environment for plants to grow well. Then, from this understanding of what plants need to grow, I'll introduce the different types of compost. The video will cover the best compost for seedlings, what all-purpose compost is, the type of compost found in grow bags, ericaceous compost, compost for more mature plants like fruit bushes and trees, and compost for house plants. It will also talk about John Innes compost and what the numbers John Innes number one, John Innes number two or John Innes number three actually are when they are printed on the outside of compost bags. So there's a lot to cover in this video. If you want to jump to a particular section of the video, I've divided it into chapters and you can find links to these in the video description. But before starting, a disclaimer to say that whilst I make every effort to get my facts straight, please make your own decisions based on your own research on buying compost. And as YouTube policy does not allow me to edit this video after publishing, if I create a new video to update this one, I'll change the title of this video to make this clear, and I'll provide a link to the new video in the description. And if you like this video, please hit the like button or leave a comment. And for more content like this, please subscribe to my YouTube channel or visit my website, allotmentbook.co.uk. Compost is made from organic matter like food waste, grass clippings or shredded woody material from bushes or trees. There is a wide range of ingredients that can go into making compost, but in general terms, compost is made from roughly equal amounts of green materials, sometimes called wet materials, like food waste or green plant material, combined with dry materials like shredded wood. Each manufacturer of compost will have their own recipe for making compost. But inside their compost, manufacturers often add additional material like fertilisers or aggregate to change the texture of their compost, but more on that later. For plant growth, the crucial point is that compost is the result, or the end product, of a natural composting process where bacteria, fungi and organic organisms like worms break down all the goodness in the raw materials and convert these into nutrients that plants can use to help them grow. It is an almost magical recycling process and depending what plant material is used at the beginning of the process, this will affect what nutrients will be available at the end. The raw ingredients used partly explains why composts are different, combined with what manufacturers choose to add into their compost mixes afterwards. Compost is only one part of garden soil and in soil science, this is often referred to as organic matter. By contrast, soil contains other ingredients, and put simply, a large percentage of soil is made up of weathered rock, and by weathered rock, I mean minerals. These minerals amount for a little under 50% of soil by volume, and the size of these minerals greatly affects the texture of a soil, and how well water or rain moves through a soil. For example, a clay soil has small minerals that pack tightly together, and this type of soil is wet and heavy, whereas a sandy soil has relatively large minerals, and this allows water to pass through it quickly, sometimes too quickly for plants, making the soil light and dry. The minerals found in soil typically come from the original weathered rock beneath it, but sometimes they have arrived in an area from movement by glaciers or volcanic action, or in a garden most likely builders could have brought in soil from somewhere else. Therefore, the words compost and soil have their own specific meanings. Whereas compost is almost all organic matter, soil contains much less. And just as compost contains different nutrients based upon what the compost is made from, a soil will contain different minerals based on the original parent rock. The reason why I've introduced the differences between different types of compost based on the ingredients used to make the compost and soil 
based on what Perrin Rock was weathered to make the soil, is that this explains why plants need different things to grow. This is because plants have adapted to the environment that they originally came from, and this adaptation means they perform better in some growing media compared to others. What this means in practice is that there are two main considerations. Firstly, the pH value of a soil, which is often described as how acidic it is. And the second is how rich a soil is in terms of the nutrients it contains to help plants grow. Some plants have adapted to grow best with more acid soil. These include crops like potatoes, rhubarb, sorrel, blackberries, blueberries and raspberries. Other plants prefer a more alkaline soil and these include cabbage, kale, cauliflower and fruit like grapes and plums. And then there are the plants that prefer a neutral soil like peas, onions and shallots, as well as spinach and chard. Some plants grow best in rich growing compost, or compost that contains a lot of nutrients. Tomatoes, courgettes and winter squash are all greedy plants that will provide a bigger harvest when grown in rich growing media. For other crops, the harvest size can actually be reduced if grown in too rich conditions. For example, peas may produce lots of leaves, but few pea pods if grown in a rich compost. The age of plants is also a factor. Seeds contain all the nutrients they need to grow, so at this stage of growth, having extra nutrients in a rich compost is not required. By contrast, when planting perennial plants like fruit bushes and fruit trees, using a rich compost can both boost growth and help sustain the plants over the years ahead. Up to this point in the video, I've introduced many of the differences plants have, and whilst this knowledge is important, it can make choosing a compost seem a little complicated. Whilst having a basic understanding of what different plants need to grow is important, there are many things that plants have in common. At the end of the video, I'll summarise everything and describe what compost I buy and how I use it when gardening. So, whilst plants have their own nutrients and soil preferences, there are many common factors too. The nutrient requirements for plants are similar. All plants need moisture to grow, as well as carbon and nitrogen. Water comes through rain, carbon from the air, but plants need to get their nitrogen from soil or compost. Whilst nitrogen is the most important nutrient, plants also need others in much smaller amounts, and these include phosphorus, potassium, calcium, zinc, magnesium and copper, to name a few. The good news is that nearly all compost contains these nutrients. It is only the richness of the nutrients that tends to vary. In addition, plants grow best in a healthy soil, and a healthy soil needs a good soil structure to allow water and air to move through it. And soil life, like bacteria and earthworms, to break down plant waste into nutrients plant roots can absorb. This is common across all plant types. I've created a separate video on soil nurturing and what makes a healthy soil, and I'll link to this beneath the video. Therefore, because plants have common requirements for nutrients and a good soil structure, this makes it possible for a general purpose compost to work for the large majority of plants. Or, said another way, whilst plants may perform best with a compost specific to their needs, they will still grow well with a general type of compost. As mentioned earlier, compost is nothing more than a combination of green or wet garden waste, like food waste or grass cuttings, mixed with brown or wet material like shredded branches. And when these ingredients are combined together, the composting process will start naturally. This video is not about how to make homemade compost but I do want to introduce three challenges when using homemade compost. Firstly, homemade compost is often too wet. This is because a gardener most likely has more green than brown materials. If using homemade compost as a mulch that goes on top of growing beds, this is not a problem. But if used as a growing media, it may be too wet and not have enough air inside it for plants to grow well. Secondly, it is possible for seeds to survive a composting process whether that is grass seed or garden weeds. Hot composting, which uses composting containers that trap heat, will kill these seeds. However, if using traditional cold composting in a compost heap, a gardener may find that when using their homemade compost, 
it spreads weeds around their garden or results in weeds growing in their seed trays when trying to germinate seeds. Thirdly, traditional composting takes time, sometimes up to a year or longer. This means that if a large quantity of compost is required, it will require a large amount of space to be dedicated to a compost heap. Sometimes it is not practical to do this. I want to say that none of these reasons have stopped me making my own compost, but because of the reasons I've just described, I do buy shop-bought compost too, especially for germinating seeds. You may also like to see my video on hot composting, which makes it possible to make compost in 46 weeks. I'll link to this below the video. Peat has many properties that make it an excellent ingredient for compost. It is made from organic material that has not fully composted. And when added to a compost mix, it helps to create a good structure to allow water and air to circulate as well as acting as a source of nutrients like nitrogen. Unfortunately, peat forms in relatively rare waterlogged ground conditions and it takes many years to even create a thin layer of peat. Peat is commonly extracted from existing peat bogs rather than being mass produced and therefore it is not a sustainable resource. And for that reason, I choose to use peat-free compost, even though peat is an excellent ingredient for growing plants. When buying compost, the packaging of compost often makes it clear whether a compost is made without peat. In this section of video, I introduce the different types of compost it is possible to buy, starting with John Innes compost. So what is John Innes compost? The name of John Innes on compost bags can be confusing, because John Innes is not actually a brand or manufacturer of compost. Rather, John Innes takes its name from a wealthy benefactor who founded a horticultural research institution. And this institution in the 1930s created a recipe for different types of compost based on scientific research of how the compost helped plants to grow. The original recipe used a combination of soil, peat and sand. But since then, peat-free variations have been developed. A distinctive feature of John Innes is the use of soil in the body of the compost instead of just compost. The use of soil adds more body or weight to the compost, with peat helping to provide a good soil structure and provide nutrients. The use of peat, as I mentioned before, is a challenge from a sustainability standpoint. But today, there is a selection of peat-free John Innes variants. At the time of creating this video, there is a manufacturer's association that specifies the recipes for John Innes compost. And these recipes are followed by manufacturers when creating their brand of compost. But not all John Innes labelled composts are identical, as although producers need to follow the recipe, the recipe allows for variation. For example, in the use of peat and peat substitutes, and some flexibility in the percentage of different ingredients. One of the distinctive features of John Innes compost is the simple naming of the different recipes, which are based on the life stage of the plants. John Innes seed compost is, as the name suggests, for germinating seeds, but it is also used as a planting media for plant cuttings. John Innes number one is for young seedlings before they are transplanted to their final growing position. It is lower in nutrients than other types to suit the growing stage of the plants. John Innes number two is a general purpose mix for established plants. It can be used for growing vegetables in troughs and containers and also for house plants. It contains double the amount of nutrients compared to John Innes number one. John Innes number three is the most nutrient rich recipe. It is designed for larger plants, bushes and shrubs. Given its high nutrient content, it's also good for greedy plants like tomatoes and squash. There is also an ericaceous compost, but I'll talk more about ericaceous compost later. Speaking personally, what I like about the John Innes approach is that it provides clear guidance on what each John Innes numbered compost is designed to be used for. Aside from John Innes compost, there are many other composts to choose from 
And as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, these include compost made entirely of organic matter, meaning without containing soil or loam, which is a relatively rare resource. And as I said before, I choose compost that includes the words peat-free on the packaging. The absence of soil and peat in these composts can make these composts lighter compared to John Innes' recipes. Instead of soil, these composts may include additional ingredients like sand and grit to help their texture. I'll describe these composts in this part of the video. Seed and cutting compost has a fine texture and relatively small particle size to provide ideal growing conditions for sowing seed and potting up plant cuttings. The fine texture is created by processing or milling the compost to reduce the particle size. The small particle size can create problems with drainage and for this reason the compost often has added grit or sand to create gaps in the compost to allow air and water to pass through. Compared to seed compost, general purpose or all purpose compost has a more coarse texture. It is often possible to see shredded wood within the compost mix. I use general purpose compost frequently for sowing seeds and taking cuttings and I found it to work well. There are general purpose composts with added nutrients or other properties to boost plant growth. With so many to choose from, I cannot recommend one type over another. My personal experience is to use a normal general purpose compost, unboosted with other ingredients, and then feed my plants when watering later in the growing season, if required. As mentioned earlier in the video, there are some plants that prefer more acidic growing conditions. And for these plants, I buy ericaceous compost to help them grow well. For example, when I planted my blueberry bushes on my allotment, I added a bag of ericaceous compost to each planting hole and they have performed very well since then. There are many types of grow bags. Typically, these contain a general purpose compost with added ingredients to help with moisture retention. Extra nutrients are sometimes added to boost growth. Perhaps the biggest advantage of grow bags is their convenience, with the ability to grow plants directly in the bag without the need for repotting. In this part of the video, I'll introduce common ingredients to add to shop-bought compost, as well as a couple of specialist growing media. It is common for gardeners to add ingredients to their compost to seek the particular growing requirements of plants. These ingredients often help with drainage to create a lighter, less wet soil, or alternatively to help with water retention, while still allowing a good structure for air and water to pass through. Grit is added to compost to help with drainage. Compost that consists only of organic matter or with low soil content has a tendency to shrink and stick together. Adding grit helps by creating air spaces in the soil to keep the soil structure open. I like to keep a bag of grit at home for exactly this purpose. I regularly use the grit when preparing compost for pots, for example to grow heat-loving herbs like thyme, basil and coriander. These herbs, and many others, prefer a free-draining soil. Perlite feels a little like polystyrene, but is made by heating a type of rock until it expands and becomes filled with air. Like grit, perlite helps water to drain through a compost, but perlite itself also absorbs water and therefore helps keep moisture in the soil. Because perlite is so light, it can also be used to provide a thin covering over surface sown seed. Vermiculite is another natural mineral that is used in a similar way to perlite. It improves water drainage and by absorbing water helps to keep the soil moist. Its light brown colour gives the compost a slightly more natural appearance than the bright white colour of perlite. Mushroom compost was developed as a byproduct of the mushroom growing industry and may contain peat if this was used for growing mushrooms. It contains many nutrients and is commonly slightly alkaline in nature, which is helpful when growing crops like cabbage, kale and broccoli.
Cocoa bricks that contain coir are made from the hairy husks of coconuts. They are sold dry and then hydrated in a bucket of water before use. The coir is excellent at retaining water and is often used as a substitute for peat in compost formulations. Like peat, coir has the ability to retain moisture whilst improving the overall texture of a compost, allowing water and air to pass through. My experience with coir is that whilst it is excellent at retaining moisture, it does come with one disadvantage compared to peat. Unlike peat, coir does not contain nutrients. Therefore, I need to add additional nutrients when watering to make up for this, to keep the plants growing well. And to complete my look at compost ingredients, is to show a specialist orchid compost potting mix. Orchids are a great example of specialisation as they grow on a bark-based compost with very little, if any, green organic matter. Understanding where orchids come from helps with selecting the best compost to use. Orchids grow in tropical rainforests and are often found in trees at the point where a branch meets the main trunk. Therefore, a bark-based compost matches most closely to the growing conditions the plants are adapted to. Before finishing the video, I want to share what compost I buy and how I use it. At home and on the allotment, I always want to have available general purpose compost, gardening grit and a supply of homemade compost. At the beginning of the growing season, I may purchase a bag or two of seed and cutting compost for germination, but only if I've run out of general purpose compost at the end of the last growing season. Seed compost generally comes in smaller bags than general purpose compost and as it is designed specifically to germinate seeds, I sometimes buy it out of convenience. But most often I will use general purpose compost for all my growing needs. Depending on the plant when potting up, I will add grit to the compost to help with drainage. However, I'll only add grit if the plant really needs it. I mentioned earlier I use grit for Mediterranean herbs but I'll also use it for pot plants like aloe vera and other succulents. If I'm planting out greedy vegetables like winter squash or courgettes, or fruit bushes, canes or trees, I will mix either my homemade compost or general purpose compost with garden soil in the planting hole. Adding compost helps to feed the plants, whilst the original soil gives more weight and stability. I use my homemade compost to feed and condition my existing garden and allotment beds, as well as plants that have permanent homes in large containers. My homemade compost is quite wet, but it is excellent as a mulch that goes on top of the soil. Life in the soil will quickly draw it down below the surface and the sun will help dry it out. And when required, I may make a special trip to a garden centre to buy ericaceous compost, but only if I need this to add to a planting hole of an acid-loving plant, like a rosebush, hydrangea or blueberry bush. If I'm simply feeding the plants, I'll use my homemade compost as a mulch. And that's it. I hope you found my guide on the best compost for growing fruit, vegetables and herbs useful. If you did, please click the like button. Also, it would be great to receive any comments on the video, especially any ideas and techniques you use for your own plants. I try to respond to as many comments as I can. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, please subscribe to the YouTube channel in the usual way or visit my website allotmentbook.co.uk